to introduce uh, Professor Sarah Tolberg, uh, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Education uh, at University of Canterbury uh, in Ottawa, New Zealand. Previously, an associate professor in teaching, learning, and sociocultural studies at the University of Arizona. Sarah represents a very important strand of scholarship within science education uh, that is concerned with, it, with equity and social justice, uh, which Ayush beautifully introduced us to. Um, and of course, it takes on the task of critically investigating and interrogating main, mainstream STEM education practices, which concerns itself with what is called science in the laboratory. This strand of work politicizes science education by placing it within the larger oppressive politico-economic regimes, which perpetuate, to quote from one of her publications, neoliberal capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, and new global apartheid between haves and have nots. Sarah is a former science teacher and environmental educator and has worked with students in multilingual contexts in the USA, Ottawa, New Zealand, Mexico, Guatemala. Her scholarship draws from feminist studies, anti-colonial and critical theory, environmental humanities, science and technology studies, and critical pedagogy to explore possibilities for justice through science and education in the Anthropocene. Um, some of her current projects include post-digital pedagogies of care, the Pangarao Unleashed, a multiple case study of de-streaming secondary mathematics, Friday, a praxis of radical love and critical hope for science education, and reimagining science education in the Anthropocene. She co-leads the Ototahi Food Justice Research Collaborative, a UC Community and Urban Resilience Initiative, and the UC Learning for Earth Futures Research Cluster. The title of Professor Tolbert's talk today would be science education as a social movement. The talk would be for about 45 minutes, after which we will have 15 minutes of discussion. So over to you, Professor Tolbert. Welcome. Uh, and once again, I'm very glad to have you here. So if there are questions uh, that spring up uh, during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the chat box. We could take it later or we could have Q&A uh, for the designated uh, time afterwards. So feel free to put in your questions there as in when you have them. Over to you, Professor Tolbert. Thank you so much, Ashwati. Um, it's really an honor to be here. And I'm looking forward, again, as I mentioned before, um, to having some rich transnational discussions and learning from all of you. Um, because I know there's a lot, um, a, a rich context for thinking about social movements in India um, historically and also currently um, given the current uh, political climate. So I'm just going to um, talk to you first a little bit about my background and how I came to this and how I continue to think about my role as a science educator. And I've broadened the, the focus of the talk um, to look at STEM education because I know um, some of you are coming from disciplines other than just science. Um, and my work is actually not limited to just science education. It's, it spans across um, science, mathematics, um, as well as the humanities, as Ashwathi men mentioned earlier, too. Um, my, my background is actually in environmental studies. That's how I uh, started. I got my undergraduate degree in environmental studies at the University of Colorado and uh, worked in environmental and outdoor education for a short time before I became a classroom science teacher in New York City. And if I'm, if I'm being completely honest, I I'd kind of hoped for a social studies position at the time, but science education was a shortage area and I had a, a lot of science coursework in my undergraduate degree. So, um, so I, I took a role as a science educator, a science teacher in um, a junior high school in the South Bronx of New York City, predominantly African-American and Puerto Rican students um, and a highly economically marginalized com community at that time. Um, and my background started out there and I, and I really enjoyed the work and um, as I'm sure all of you have experienced just um, being an educator is so fulfilling and, and being able to work with such amazing young people um, and students who, um, you know, who, who make you want to get out of bed and go to work every day. Um, it's just the most fulfilling experience I think that I've had in my life being in that, in that role. Um, but I started to feel uh, 
disempowered after a couple of years. I started to feel like I was, I was doing an okay job as a science teacher, but I started to feel like it wasn't enough because I looked at the structural conditions of inequity um, in which my students lived and, and the sociopolitical conditions that they faced. And I saw them go from the junior high and you know, um, going and really loving science into um, the local zoned high school where many of them would drop out at an early age. Um, and I also saw conditions of like um, economic oppression um, that were institutionalized and part of the fabric of society. Um, and so I started asking myself the big questions, what does it mean for me to be a science educator in this space? And um, how can I uh, affect change in not just my own classroom, but in the broader sociopolitical context that, that constrain opportunities to learn for the students who I love so much. And, and so I left um, and went and explored a few different possibilities with that particular frame of mind. And that's kind of where I've stayed. Um, the, those big questions of, you know, how do we intervene um, in the socio-political conditions that constrain opportunities to learn for marginalized students who um, just are phenomenal people, right? And deserve so much better. So how do we disrupt that? Because there's a history of oppression that um, it's not, you know, it's not just within one generation. How do we work as part of an intergenerational struggle to, to disrupt those conditions um, and, and transform them for the better? So I've, I've been thinking about that since I started teaching in the 90s, all those years ago, and, um, you know, learned so much from, from so many people along the way. Um, I later went and worked in Mexico and Guatemala, as Ashwathi mentioned, in adult education, and then came back and was a classroom teacher in Atlanta, Georgia, for a while before I went um, to get my PhD in science education um, at University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, so I, I'm interested in the relationships between truth, power, and science education, and Ashwathi Ravindran, who just introduced me, thank you, who's also done great work in this space, and um, Jesse Bazul have, have written recently about this in the context of India, and just reflecting on the relationships between science, education, government, and how science is used as a sort of a form of truth with a capital T, and government represents power and wields power, and sometimes in the name of science you know, as truth with a capital T. Um, so it's really important as science educators to understand the politics of education, but the politics of governance more broadly and the role of science and science education in that space. And I think uh, Roland, who's written for Science for the People has also said, uh, part of that understanding is to see the influence of uh, politics in science and science education uh, and to help us, you know, deconstruct that and then reimagine the ways that or the opportunities for practicing science from a justed oriented lens. And this is not something that one person can do. This is not the work of a hero. And I think that that's what really, I think resonates with me because as a young teacher starting out, you know, in my early twenties in the South Bronx, um, thinking that I, I had to fix it all somehow. And, and that's not how social change works. We have to see ourselves as part of a collective of people reimagining the way that we practice science and um, the way we practice STEM education. And so I'm, I'm so happy to be here to, to have the opportunity to, to hopefully chat with you about, about that as well um, and learn more about what you're doing in your own context. Um, yes, as we've written before, we look at how, um, you know, we feel, we feel as if there really is a socio-political turn for STEM education, for science education right now, um, and has been for the past several years, that we think that there are um, all kinds of movements around the world, whether small or large, of people who are saying, you know what, we're not going to, um, uh, we're not going to tolerate science or education as a tool of social reproduction. Um, that we want, we want a different kind of education and we want a different kind of science. We want an education for liberation and we want a science for liberation. And so we see this bubbling up around the world in so many different places. And furthermore, we see this in the more recent context of the COVID pandemic. We can see um, how new opportunities for um, living well together, for solidarity and commitment to others, um, being guided by an ethic of care and equitable distribution of resources, um, and pluralistic science that can help us all live better together, um, that we've seen this emerge from the COVID pandemic. So while the COVID pandemic has been heartbreaking in so many ways, we've also seen opportunities for um, collective ethics of care and a new kind of collective politics. So just going back a little bit to, to thinking about what is this 
idea mean for us as science educators? Because a lot of us do work within pretty small, like particular classrooms or schools or institutions, for example. So we'd want to go from the big to the small, from the micro to the macro and, and back and forth. Um, and so for me, um, one of the projects that I've been involved with has uh, was called Community Engagement and Youth Leadership Through Science Education. So I worked with a local teacher for four years in Tucson, Arizona, and we worked uh, around the science curriculum for the state of Arizona. And we, we actually worked to make it a more justice oriented curriculum and start with local and global justice issues as what centered our curriculum and instruction. So we looked at things that mattered to the young people. We asked them what they were interested in learning. We looked um, to local organizations to better understand what were the local environmental justice issues that students and their families were facing that were the most pressing issues, as well as what are the local environmental justice justice issues in the state and historically, and we designed a curriculum around issues of water contamination, water rights. We looked at urban the urban heat island effect, for example, how um, families in the south side of the town had less tree cover than those living in the more affluent, um, economically resourced north side of town and living in a desert. Those kinds of things matter in terms of the way that we experience heat, particularly when um, you know it's over 40 degrees Celsius in Arizona in the summertime. Um, so we partnered with organizations that could help support us do this work again, because it's not just about me or the teacher in that one classroom. It's looking to uh, draw from what others are doing uh, in the community and across the state and in the nation. So we partnered with several folks who are already working on this issue for a while. And we did a few field trips. One was to the Hopi reservation um, in Black Mesa, in Second Mesa. So we went to the Hopi uh, reservation and heard from Hopi elders speak about their struggle with water rights and, and activism. Um, some students worked to create, uh, to, to secure funding for a, a bridge um, that they needed to get to school because during monsoon season, they were unable to get to their school. So they designed a unit, we designed a unit around that and, and they were actually able to successfully get their design funded. Um, so just thinking about, and as one of the students said, thinking about all the different groups that you can work with makes you feel like you can actually um, make a difference in the world. So that's what a lot of the students took away from this was feeling empowered through collective action and feeling like, oh yeah, there are others around me who are doing this work and who I can lean on and who, you know, who I can become involved with to see change or at least learn better understand the problems that are facing us. So related to that, another project that I've been involved with uh, in Tucson, Arizona was called Sociopolitical Praxis in Science Education. And this project was really interesting because this was a bit wider. This was um, not just working with one teachers, but we worked with several teachers across multiple schools in the Tucson area who were science teachers and looking to do something different, looking to uh, teach against the grain, to teach in non-traditional ways, not just to teach the standard decontextualized curriculum, but to really look at things that matter to students and things that matter to them. So sustainability issues, um, environmental justice issues. So they were working together to create lessons around local, local justice issues. But at the same time, there was a larger movement, a socio-political movement, teacher resistance movement going on in the US and in Arizona. And so through these small acts of resistance, they found that they had to make space for, right, in their, in their own schools, you know, finding ways to justify teaching from this non-traditional perspective. Um, they also found uh, ways to connect with each other and become part of these uh, more spectacular resistance movements. And so they became involved in, in what was called the Red for Ed movement at the time. And uh, the teachers went and striked um, for several days and they marched to the Capitol and demanded better working conditions, but also better learning conditions for their students and um, for all, all the staff who worked in Arizona schools. So they realized at the time, and one of the teachers who participated in this project with us said that they actually have a lot more freedom than they know. And that was another thing that came to them through working in, in solidarity with others, you know, that they became empowered through, through that understanding that you can, you can work um, as part of a collective to affect change. Again, disrupting that idea or that, that sort of um, isolation of being a teacher where you just shut the door and teach in your own classroom and do the best that you can. More recently, I've been looking at food justice issues, and this came up um, in particular uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and the ways in which a lot of people even here in Otatahi Christchurch in, in New Zealand are experiencing 
um, um, you know, what we sometimes call hidden hunger, right? That the access to food, but they don't have access to food that, you know, um, for example, is freshly grown or, or produce or organic foods or things like that. And so we're looking at ways to connect with local organizations um, as part of a broader food justice effort. But we're also interested in the ways in which participating in these food justice efforts or this um, food commons, as a lot of these spaces are being called, where everyone's allowed to come and, and take food, food from the commons if they need it. Um, we're looking at ways that this also creates uh, social and emotional well being or enhances social and emotional well being as people come together um, in these spaces, um, not just to learn how to grow food, but also to reconnect um, with each other. So that's been really promising work that just getting started. Uh, the, the work that I've been doing in mathematics over the past couple of years relates to uh, what's called tracking. This is something that's very common in a lot of countries around the world, but from what I've been told in India, it's not as much of a thing, especially not until you get to upper secondary from my understanding, but you can tell me later what, what's going on around this. Um, but essentially this is when Students are placed into either lower uh, mathematics courses, low level mathematics courses versus advanced mathematics courses. That doesn't just happen in mathematics, it often also happens in science and other subject areas. Um, but what, what happens if you look at the data on who gets access to the lower ability or they call them ability, but lower, lower mathematics courses versus higher mathematics courses, it's very highly racialized. Um, where you see students of racial minority background in the lower uh, tracks or in the lower streams and white students and often more white male students in the higher tracks or the higher streams of those mathematic courses. So in partnership with, an, with a group called Tukona Teiraki, they're a Maori Futures Collective, um, indigenous rights activists who have basically looked at all the data from what happens in streaming in, in New Zealand schools and said that this is a racist practice because if you look at the outcomes, the outcomes are racist. More Maori and Pacifica students are in the lower level mathematics classes than in the higher level mathematics classes. And this is a pattern of inequity that's existed for decades. So if a pattern of inequity has existed for decades and despite what we try to do by getting more, um, more Maori and Pacifica students in the more advanced mathematics classes, and it's not having an effect, it's a racist practice. It continues to reinforce racial hierarchy. So we're basically saying that this uh, cannot be allowed to happen anymore. So we've been working with, with schools across uh, New Zealand, across Aotearoa, who are on the journey of streaming. So they're looking at, um, yes, they've accepted that this practice is inequitable and that they can't support it anymore. So now they're thinking, what does it look like to do it differently? And because the practice, uh, the Ministry of Education has said, this is a racist practice, we're not going to tell you how to do it. We're going to say that it's racist, but we can't mandate that you do anything different. Now, because of that, we're working with schools who are actually already on the journey of doing this and hoping that they can create and provide models that they can be leaders in the space so that other schools who are sort of thinking about how, if they were to stop streaming, what would that look like and how would they do it? They can look at these other schools that we've been working with um, and, and see that it is possible and there's not just one way to do that, that there are multiple ways to do this work. There are multiple ways to de-stream mathematics. And, and so um, basically we come together, where it's a partnership of, of um, as you can see, multiple schools and organizations and university researchers, and we meet periodically and we share resources. It's a, a collective where we come together, they talk about their individual journeys and struggles and opportunities that they're facing as individual schools. And then another school might have a different kind of perspective to offer the school um, to help support them in that struggle and help them move forward and vice versa. So it's a really supportive space where people can feel like, I mean, part of the problem of being at the, at the front of a movement that's not very popular with some people is the feeling of isolation, right? So, so being able to come together and share and, and talk through what they're doing and how, to, and how to bring others into the movement successfully is really, really important for, for them and for us. And related to that, I've done some similar work in science education with secondary science teachers around, and this was mostly in the United States. So they were all in different places around the US. Um, and we came together and loosely called ourselves a teacher empowerment collective um, where we would meet uh, once a month online. And we started with just two teachers and then myself and Alexa Shindell as the university um, partners. 
and just meet once a month. And part of it was Alexa and I actually at the time when we first started out, because I was working with the teacher from the community engagement project and she was working with a teacher in uh, Rochester, New York, and we wanted the community. So we came together as just a, a group of four um, to share ideas. And we, and we thought, oh, these two teachers have got to meet each other because they have so much in common. They're both trying to do this work and they would have so much to, to, to say and do and, and, and ways to support each other. So we started with just those two teachers and then the, the group grew over the years. Um, and eventually we had anywhere from 10 to 12 science teachers meeting together once a month. And each teacher would take a uh, a different session so that would we rotate each month and a teacher would lead the session and what they would do is they would re, uh, do a reflective piece of writing just a couple of paragraphs in a google doc the day before the meeting we would all read what they had written and we call these critical incidents so they would share something that was going on with them in relation to teaching for social justice or youth empowerment and share a little bit about what happened and what they did. And then we would come together and talk about that critical incident. So it'd be one or two teachers each meeting who was, who was uh, facilitating this dialogic conversation around a critical incident that occurred in their own, in their own institution and in their own educational space. So things were, you know, we talk about things from just a, a classroom activity that they've done that they wanted to share and get feedback on all the way to people who were feeling, you know, like they needed support because their institution was giving them a hard time for the work that they were doing. And so we talked about how to navigate those kinds of situations. So it's really about, again, building solidarity and drawing from our um, collective professional and personal expertise to support teaching science for social justice. So <clears throat> moving from these smaller school-based initiatives or small groups of people and thinking now about what does it mean to go from that to build a movement, I think is a really important question for all of us. And I've actually been thinking about this since 2018 at the Science Educators for Equity and Diversity and Social Justice Conference, which is an organization that a few of us started in 2016, but we didn't have our first conference until 2018 um, because we felt like we also needed a space that was outside the mainstream science education institution or outside the mainstream education research communities um, in which we felt we didn't get enough support for what it means to do this kind of work and what it means to teach for social justice, what it means to be an academic for social justice or an educator for social justice or a little bit of both or a community organizer um, and, and what does that look like and how can we, um, how can we build community around that because the small spaces behind the scenes that we've found and those more professional uh, mainstream organizations just didn't feel like quite enough. It wasn't quite what we needed. So not finding what we needed, we built our own. And, um, and so far we started with, I think a handful of, of members and now we've grown to 500 members. Um, but at that first conference in 2018, after we had, you know, we're so happy to have met each other and had these three days together where we all shared different activities or different research or different you know units and different types of curriculum that we were working on um, we asked the question of each other where do we go from here and one of our attendees at the time one of our seeds members Siddharth Bharath he said um, we all need to be thinking like a movement so when we leave here how can we each think like a movement when we go back to our our own locations and that's something that stuck with me um, since then as well so thinking about how do we build movements how do we start where we are? And there are some great examples too. For example, the SEEDS organization, it started out very small. It's just a handful of us who are, who are working together to um, just put on a conference once a year. And then from there, trying to build and, and bring in um, more things that we can do to stay connected and pro provide support for each other. So we're now having um, activist organizing sessions or in the US, for example, how to push back against the anti-critical um, race theory laws, for example. Um, but there are other organizations as well. There's Abolition Science, and those are free podcasts, uh, radio podcasts, basically, that you can find online. That's a uh, website where um, Latoya Strong, basically, and, and, and colleagues interview people who are doing work in, in anti-racist science. And um, those are really great resources and available to the public. And there's also Science for the People, which is another great organization that started in the 60s <clears throat> as kind of a response to science and technology being used uh, for the war machine essentially and so they they started science for the people in the 60s to create a space for 
science enthusiasts and scientists to really be committed to um, science for, for human flourishing, for ecological flourishing. And they, I think, uh, uh, were pretty active around the 1960s and then kind of um, didn't do much for a while, but have been reignited more recently and now are producing magazines again and have chapters, I think, in have chapters all over the US, but also internationally, I believe. So looking at ways that we can connect with these larger movements and thinking about what are the opportunities in your own in your own context that you know could be opportunities for movement building. And finally, just reflecting on this, um, thinking about being the change, communicating the change and organizing the change, which is something that Satish Kumar has said um, and talking about how great movements to transform societies don't start from the center. They do start in these small places. You know, so oftentimes I think what we're what we're doing seems so overwhelming, but this is how these great movements start. This is how social change originates. This is how it looks like to do science differently or to do science education differently. It starts in these small places. And as Jean Anion has said, those smaller acts of resistance can constitute the spade work for a larger social movement for economic and educational justice, as we've seen with a lot of our own teachers that, that I've worked with. I think one of the challenges, and maybe we can talk a little bit about this if you're interested, is the challenge of becoming undisciplined. <clears throat> so the challenge of thinking outside our disciplinary boundaries or outside the ways in which we let our discipline police us or the way we've been trained police us to think inside the box and not outside of it. Um, you know, messages we tell ourselves when we want to teach um, maybe something that's more justice oriented about it, it not being sciencey enough, for example. Because as Sheila Jasonoff has said, disciplines cling tightly to their paradigmatic boundaries, reflect, reluctant to reflect too deeply on whether they're asking the right questions. So I think it's important for us to reflect on when we're doing that to ourselves and to each other. Um, yeah. And then from there, how do we reimagine STEM knowledge and practice for, for solidarity and collective well being as part of a wider social movement? We've written about the ways in which political imagination and love are necessary tools that help us see those different possib possibilities. So if we start with our political imaginations and political love and, and hopes and dreams about a different kind, kind of world and a different way to be, that, that's when we see these different possibilities. It starts with idealism, idealistic thinking. And um, related to that, I've been working with Alejandro Frausto Aceves and Betabe Torres Olave on looking at drawing inspiration from Freire's work, from Paulo Freire's work in science education and celebrating his uh, centenary last year. So thinking a, a little bit more as well about um, these small pockets of resistance that we are involved with and how they can be connected to international solidarities as an act of love in STEM. So again, reaching out across um, national borders to see what people are doing and how we can support each other around the globe. Um, as, as an act of love in science education, as a transgressive possibility and as a way to, to cultivate solidarity toward a science for the people from below in the service of liberation. And that's where I'll stop because I really just I wanna have us a few minutes to talk with you and um, have an opportunity to hear things that are going on with you or, or for you to talk to each other about um, your successes and struggles or questions in this space. So I will just open it up. I'll stop sharing. And if you'd like me to go back to the slide, feel free to ask. I'm happy to do that. Um, yeah, I'll just open it up to questions now. Um, I do see a question here, actually, from, thanks, Ishan, um, from Mitra. If there's time, I'm interested in knowing the specifics of how detracking mathematics is being implemented, just to understand ways to think about learning levels. Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think um, it depends on the school, but what a lot of schools are doing is looking at or drawing inspiration from complex instruction. If you're familiar with that at all, it's work that comes out of uh, Elizabeth Cohen and Rachel Lowton's um, work in mathematics, but also Joe Bowler, um, their work in mathematics that looks at the ways in which um, helping all students engage in high level mathematics through what they call like group worthy tasks are um, actually help, help students overcome their own um, lack of 
confidence to see that they can actually, that they are capable of, of problem solving with support from their peers. And so that's one, one way that, that I think people are addressing that. Um, there's also work from Bobby Hunter um, with Pacifica uh, students here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that's kind of a similar type of, of project. And that's called um, Designing Mathematical Inquiry Communities, I believe, DMIC, they call it, D-M-I-C. So there are a couple of different ways that people are doing that. Um, but I think that's that's kind of the critical question that we're looking at right now in terms of working with the schools that we're working with. Um, we're working with a couple of schools that are predominantly Maori serving schools who have never never tracked students anyway. So they sort of provide this model of like, well, we've never done that, you know, because it's a smaller schooling environment. Plus, it's um, it's not really in aligned with their own uh, ethical commitments. Right. So so they're providing, I think, a lot of support to some of the other schools who are, who are doing this as well. But yeah, great question. There's also a question from Ishan, uh, where he asks, what kinds of risks, theoretical, epistemological, social, and personal, did you have to take throughout your work? Oh, so many, Ishan. <laughs> <laughs> So many. I mean, it's so fascinating, right? Because we read about the policing of disciplinary boundaries a lot, right? But when you see it in your own lived experience, this is fascinating. Um, I have, uh, I was told when I first did my, my first job talk, um, uh, after I completed my PhD, that I shouldn't use the word sociopolitical in my job talk, because I will never get a job. So that was kind of one of the first times that I, um, that I, experienced that. I did anyway, because I thought to myself, I don't want to work anywhere where I'm not allowed to talk about sociopolitical stuff, you know, <laughs> like I'll just go back and I'll go back to uh, classroom teaching and I'm, I love classroom teaching. So if I can't get a job being a professor doing the work that I want to do, then I'll go back to the classroom. And yeah, so um, that's one example. Another example is um, when I've publicly pushed back on some of the mainstream organizations, I've literally gotten phone calls of people who told me like, I'm going to lose my job because no one is going to let me get tenure or people are going to start to talk. And if I ever want to move from the institution where I was, um, nobody will hire me because I'm, I'm out there saying all these things about, um, you know, critiquing mainstream science education, for example. And again, it's sort of, well, I mean, I don't want to work at a place that's not going to hire me because I have an opinion about, about something. Like, you know, edu higher education should be about um, being able to, to entertain these radical ideas. I mean, we have to protect that. And we, we don't protect it if we don't practice it. So we absolutely have to push back. But it is hard, right? It is really, really hard. Um, I think that when I did go out and, and look for a position, um, there were certain certain institutions that were really looking for someone who could fit inside the box of mainstream science education. So you know that, you know, they're not going to be interested in, in your work or in my work, for example. And so it's kind of coming to terms with, with that and, and really, um, you know, being able to make a strong commitment. And I think I see it partly as doing what we, what we possibly can within our own arena of power. Like my choices might've been available to me. May, maybe they're not as available to someone else, um, but we do what we can so that the person who comes after us has a bit of an easier time, right? So it's hard and we push back and it's a struggle and you get a lot of backlash, but maybe the next person who comes along has an easier time. And that, that kind of helps too as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Ayush has a question. Uh, I'll read it out. I'm curious to hear more about challenges you have faced in starting these movement spaces. And also, are there specific challenges pertaining to forming solidarities across lines of power and privilege? Would love to hear some stories of how you navigated these challenges. Thanks, Ayush. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... There are always challenges in any movement space, and particularly how do you build solidarity, solidarities across power and privilege is a really important question. And that's, um, that's something that I think is really important anywhere, particularly important here where we have like intersectional struggles, but it doesn't look the same for everyone, right? For example, we have um, indigenous um, communities here 
uh, Maori communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who have particular um, histories and particular kinds of justice struggles that are really, really important, that are different from um, refugee and immigrant background communities who also have really, really important particular justice struggles. So I think um, part of the challenge is bringing people together and being able to listen, you know, practice radical listening. Um, but I think that that happens through, um, you know, just a lot of, of attention to being a community first and then developing a collective platform second, right? So I think it's challenging when the politics are so urgent to build these intersectional coalitions. Um, but in order to, for those intersectional coalitions to stay together and not fall apart, uh, there has to be time to just, you know, come together and be with each other and get to know each other and develop relationships of trust, um, or at least relationships of, of connection, of, of feeling, you know, um, like there's a, there's, there's a mutual benefit, let's say, of all of us being in this space together. Um, but before we kind of develop a platform around that, we have to, we have to feel good about who we are together as a collective. And we have to spend some time developing our collective identity. So I think that startup, like that visioning work, that that mission of, an, of a new organization, for example, or a new collective is really, really important. And some people might find that um, takes away from those action oriented items, but it's essential. Yeah. Um, Ayush has a follow up. Also curious about this. So often uh, academia rewards knowledge mining uh, rather than creating social material changes in the lives of folks. Grants, awards, etc. are structured to prevent that kind of social material change. What changes do you think are needed to academic structures to allow us to do that work? Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of changes in academic structures that I think are needed. And there are a lot of us who um, need to also be more transparent about the ways in which you can do it differently. <clears throat> and, um, you know, again, again, it's a, it's a form of policing academics too, right? That you have to publish in certain journals, you have to get certain types of grants um, in order to be a successful academic, in order to keep your job, and you have to be about knowledge production in a very traditional sense um, or a very patriarchal sense of the word. Um, so there, there are a lot of people I think working to change this. I think partly um, part, part of what we've done by establishing an organization is to change the narrative. So that was part of our rationale for wanting to create something different because a lot of the narratives that we heard around that kind of, um, um, you know, that talk, that, that socialization of, of junior academics happens in those professional spaces. And so we wanted to um, create an organization that could help support a different kind of narrative and help people really enact it. So by having a new organization like Seeds, for example, we have people who are more established academics who can write tenure and promotion letters for those who are coming up. Um, we have people who are serving as reviewers who are offering support rather than trying to police people um, or make it really hard for people to publish. So a lot of that type of work can be done as a community as well. If we want academia to be different, how do we make it different? And I think that's part of the, the larger project. And, and it is hard because there's so much work, but again, it's less work if we all do it together and, and provide support for each other and talk about ways in which it can be done. Um, yeah, so I think that's still ongoing, but I really do like, um, if you've read or come across um, La Paperson's book on a third university is possible. La Paperson writes with Eve Tuck um, under the name K. Wayne Yang, but um, they also write about uh, what it means to be a cyborg in a third university. So not necessarily always being focused on reforming the institution because there's so much energy and it can be really like self-defeating that goes into reforming the institution. And we need that. We absolutely need that, but also creating spaces to um, be cyborgs where we actually just use the tools of the institution um, for a particular like decolonizing purpose, for example. So I, I think that's a really good approach to to kind of, and you know, it's what like black feminism has talked about as well, like working within the margins to, 
affect change kind of under the radar. Um, so, so those things need to happen as well. We support each other to, to get the sort of, you know, publications or the grants or, you know, bringing junior scholars on board so that they can have what they need on their CV and have those experiences as well to make sure that they're protected so that they can um, continue to do the justice oriented work that's so important. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Love the response. Thank you so much. That was very, very useful. Yeah. Oh, good, good. I mean, I could talk all day about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some other time, but thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Great question. Um, There's a I'm, question I'm, from Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Saying, go ahead. Are you were saying something? Um, were you saying no, something? No, go ahead. I was looking at the questions. You go ahead, Ashwati. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if you'd like to read it out yourself, that's. Uh, no, no, you please go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I can drink my tea. <laughs> Uh, the next question is from Professor Subra. Uh, can you elaborate how the pandemic had a silver lining, especially as in India and many places, online education has led to a learning loss and inequities? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. I'm going to turn that one. I'm going to say something about it, but I'm also going to ask Ashwati to elaborate because she and um, Jesse Bazil wrote a really beautiful piece about, about some of that. Um, and so I... I will say that, I mean, it is really, really hard. Like we, we, we have to be um, kind of frank about the, the many um, losses and, and the tragedy of it all. And I think we are, a lot of us still focused on, on how, that, um, how the pandemic has exposed these broader uh, persistent historical inequities and continue to work in that space. And at the same time, see how communities came together to help each other out. I mean, part of that was because the state isn't providing what they need to be providing. Um, so there's still a real critique to be had there about supporting the state. But what happens when, when the state isn't providing um, is you can also see how communities care for each other and that kind of care becomes more visible, even though it's, it's still important to highlight uh, the lack of, of infrastructure and, and the lack of support at those multiple levels. Ashwathi, did you want to say anything about that? So um, I, uh, my guess is that uh, Professor Subra has already read my, uh, the work that I did with Jesse on the pandemic in uh, the Indian context. Uh, but there, I think we were mostly trying to explore um, uh, the kinds of uh, the power dynamics that emerged in the context of uh, the pandemic, especially around uh, medical knowledge and medical systems. You had a lot of controversies uh, being reported, especially in the media. Around uh, space, you had allopathy, and then you had Ayurveda, and there were questions around, you know, ways of validating knowledge, for instance, um, which became very moot uh, in 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 the debates in the debates within the public sphere. So, um, so as Sarah was pointing out, we were uh, primarily interested in the questions of. Um, scientific knowledge and its nexus with the state uh, and the, the legitimation that, of course, it uh, gained through the state and in the process how it's marginalized specific kinds of knowledge systems. So, um, I mean, if you'd like to read more, I think uh, I'll also share a link of the publication with you. Um, but I think there are more questions. Uh, the next question is from Ankush. Uh, have you come across instances when, in process of building community, people's personal identities conflict with collective identities? And how do you navigate such conflicts in creating new collective identities? This can be better negotiated when new communities being created. But what happens when communities evolve over time with new, with new members joining? Yeah, those are great questions. I mean... Yeah, there are always going to be those organizational politics, right, that I think every every community and every organization has to continue to deal with. And we kind of like we're going through that now um, with seeds, even just kind of reflecting on where we've been and where we've come and bumps along the way and and really taking time to, to air all, you know, any concerns 
um, that have come up along the way because we've just been working so hard to build and grow this new organization. So we're in that process now of kind of taking time to reflect and sit back and talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly that's come out of it. Um, and I think that that is really, really important. It's like family, you know? I mean, family is complicated. So you have to have times when you just, you know, you get to talk to each other more directly about, um, yeah, about the, the, the successes that you celebrate, um, but also the conflicts that come up. And certainly there are conflicts all the time, because again, these are intersectional communities. And so you'll, um, well, I think one of the things that we try to do is have norms. So every meeting or every new get together, for example, or every time we're bringing new folks into a community um, like Seeds, for example, we revisit our norms and talk about, and our vision and talk about what we're about and why we're here together. And as part of a collective, I think there is a sense that at some point it's, it has to be about the collective first but people have to feel like their individual interests are represented in the collective. And then there has to be boundaries around what the collective is and what it isn't. And I think that also happens um, as, as a new organization kind of forms or community forms. Um, and that can change over time, right? You can decide actually we're not so much about this, we're also about this other struggle and broaden out to that as well. Um, but it becomes collectively negotiated by I think being intentional about you know making sure that people are included in the community from the get-go, like that the community is actually intersectional. Because I know there are times, for example, when, you know, I, I've i kind of wanted to be in solidarity, for example, with particular indigenous movements or indigenous struggles. But if you don't have the people in, you know, at the table who represent those spaces, then you're you're bound to, um, to get it wrong. I mean, to be frank. So I think just ensuring that you have, that you're really intentional and, and you're um, reaching out to people to bring them in from the beginning is, is important. And then continuing to create space and time and slow down to actually have those conversations as a family about how things are going. Um, and then, yeah, be very intentional about how do we bring new members on board? How do we help them understand the history of this organization? But how do we also accommodate you know, the, um, the new energy and new justice struggles that others might wanna bring into this particular organization while also maintaining our focus and our own and our identity. Yeah, so it's a constant process. I mean, I don't actually have one clear answer because I just think it's messy. <laughs> it's just messy. It's just something you always, you always are working on, yeah. Other questions or thoughts? These have been really, really great questions. Thank you. Or experiences that others wanna share? I know it's kind of intimidating in an online room full of 90 people. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up? Um, sure, please. And that's that, you know, like, to, like you were mentioning the various challenges and um, and also, you know, the messiness inherent in these spaces. Um, like how, how does one as a scholar, as an activist, as a movement bu builder, like, you know, uh, uh, like keep their footing in a way, right? Like, and, and, and maintain, uh, meaning I don't mean to maintain a set path, but by meaning it can sometimes feel like getting lost in this messiness, in this complexity, it feels like sometimes like you might be losing your footing, right? And so I'm, I'm wondering if you're resonating with that and if you have any comments on that kind of a, how does one engage in that kind of self-care to be able to continue to do this work? Yeah, so I, I feel like there are two, there's self-care, right? And then there is um, the issue of like, yeah, not getting lost in the messiness. So I think not getting lost in the messiness, like I do think there's something to be said for um, having a really clear vision, right? Having a kind of collective mission for an organization and being really clear about what we're about and what we're not. Um, for example, and this is just kind of a small example, um, Danny Morales Doyle and I are, are co-leading and I encourage you to submit 
um, co-leading a new section for science education on critical perspectives. And so we had some extensive conversations about what is this and what is it not? What is the space? It, it can't be just a catch-all for everything critical, right? It has to be a, a particular kind of space um, that protects the work that actually doesn't have a place elsewhere or where people can have the, the conversations that are difficult to have in other areas of mainstream science education research journals. And so we had conversations around how we want this to be a place that really um, challenges the politics of how things are done. That's not just about inclusion and the status quo, because there's a lot of research right now about inclusion and um, and that stuff, I think there, you know, there needs to be more space for it, but it is getting increasingly more space, but there isn't um, a lot of protected space for people to have conversations about how to change the whole system or how to critique the system or, you know, um, things that really take a more historical and sociopolitical perspective on, on change in science education. So that's, that's one thing. I mean, there is something to be said for, you know, determining or trying to find out and we did that as seeds as well like what are we and what are we not and um continue to do that and so i think it can be messy but it can't be a catch-all for everything that's you know and so you, you do have to have a collective identity and that just takes a lot of work i think at the beginning um and that's co like co-generated with with people who are who are looking for that kind of space um as seeds we had that conversation around what do we want to be about but also how do we want to be right so it's not just about the content of the conversation it's about how we want to be with each other and we want it to be very anti-hierarchical because we wanted to disrupt and be something different than the sort of traditional hierarchies of, of you know of very patriarchal hierarchies in, in academia so we wanted that to be a space um, that's anti-hierarchical which is very hard to do in an institution like academia where we all have these titles you know and there and power is there, right? Like power differentials, you can't get, you can't actually work completely outside them. So we have to call them out from time to time and recognize that they still play out. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's important. And the self care, um, we can't we can't do this work if we don't care for ourselves. Like we have to give ourselves permission. I mean, Angela Davis has written so much about this, right? And she's written more beautifully than I can articulate, but that self-care is a radical act and we, we can't sustain ourselves without that. So there are times when we have to say, and that's part of the beauty of being part of a collective, like I can't do this right now. This is what I'm going through or I'm mentally and emotionally drained. Um, and that's what allyship is about too. Like, I feel like that's what, what allies are there for um, and, and good allies are there to kind of hold space um, and take things from you that you can't carry all the time by yourself. And so that's about like, and it's about teaching people how to be good allies, which I know can be exhausting work, but I think that's a benefit of a community too, is like, look, I don't need you to speak for me. This is what I need you to do. I'm like, all right, I'll step up. I'll, I'll take on that responsibility so that you can focus or that you can take the weekend off or um, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that, um, that self-care is a, is a key part of, of sustainable communities like the ones I've been talking about um, we we won't we won't be able to keep doing this if we just burn out so you're doing the collective a favor when you need to step back and let someone else step in it's hard for us though isn't it because we, we feel like all the work is so urgent <laughs> it's hard to step back but important thank you Are there any further questions? I just I, see one from Hamanshu here. There's someone from Hamanshu, but I see also a yeah, hand raise. So. Hi, I'm Vaidehi. Vaidehi, I think. Yes, yes, hi. Hi, uh, I am from West Bengal. And uh, I don't know whether my question will be relevant. That's why I was hesitating. Like uh, during this entire uh, pandemic um, situation, we have seen that many uh, community-based initiative has, uh, I mean, had uh, propped up and they have uh, started to work collectively, uh, particularly uh, led by a few students from Jadapur University, uh, Presidency University and all. Uh, but the thing, they are doing amazing wo uh, work uh, in the education, prim particularly in the uh, primary uh, uh, level education and all. But the thing is that lots of insights are coming from that. 
but uh, those community people and young students they do not uh, know how to translate gather those data uh, or uh, experiences and translate into something uh, to send it to the larger platform so that people can understand that uh, or uh, at least uh, get to know about that so i don't i was hesitating so this is not really a question in that sense but this is also i think is important that the works that are being done and particularly during pandemic situation communities i have seen particularly marginalized communities they uh, the community members they have become really uh, aware in many spaces about their children's education and all so they are giving their inputs which inputs are very important so like this is also i think i find a kind of struggle to uh, translate the entire uh, what should i say experience or whatever are coming into some kind of academic language and put it in there uh, i mean I, my question is not very uh, well formed so uh, can you like uh, can you give me some kind of in, in, in any kind of like guidance or idea like how collective uh, collectively we can actually do something um, in this space i mean how because those inputs are very important and intriguing as i have found yes um so if i understand your question correctly it's uh, that there are a lot of really great communities doing work um important work but your question is about how to make sure that others can learn about it <clears throat> on the one hand and on the other hand that um the work that families are doing to advocate for for students is um equally important and how to kind of take that into account and communicate that as well. And um and so is that correct? Do I understand yes. that correctly? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. I mean, I think that's important. I think part of the time like I, I see myself, you know, in my role as an academic and as as a researcher, university researcher, I always kind of wanted to do the work that's more participatory and I think that's really really important. to do the participatory action research alongside so that i'm also vulnerable and um not looking like the more educated other writing about people but to be fair there are times when communities actually just want me to do the research right because they're doing the activism and i'm the university professor and what they need is me to do the research and communicate the research out or document the thing that they don't have time to document because they're too busy doing the work So I think part of um part of our role as researchers is that process of negotiation with the communities that we're working with um how can we support in in the role that we hold so I mean I ho- I hold a position of power as a university professor right so I I can I might want to you know position myself as someone who's a participant observer or doing activist work but I actually need to prioritize what that community wants from me first so sometimes that's just documenting and i think that's part of the support that we can provide um and there are different ways to do that like i've i've done um i just wrote a a piece recently on on plastic pollution and waste colonialism because in new zealand we like to send all of our plastic waste out to other countries um for recycling and so i've been doing a lot of like radio interviews around this issue of looking at systemic change and and not um not just exporting our problem for example um and doing that public kind of engagements and and those um sharing of things that are going on i'm not necessarily an expert who's written about all those issues but i can share out what others in these activist and community groups are really working on what their struggle is and what they want others to hear and sometimes i'm the one who gets the platform to say the thing um but while i'm saying the thing i can also you know give them um credit for for what they're doing and 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 get support for the activism that's already going on so i think that um that's a big part of it is just thinking about how can i in my role as an academic or in in whatever role that you hold help communicate and share what's going on and sometimes it's about the writing sometimes it's about the speaking sometimes it's about just connecting teachers with each other and giving them a space to actually talk to each other so you know just inviting them to come talk to each other for example or inviting parents to come talk to each other and providing the food um for that to happen or providing the space for that to happen um so it's yeah it's about how can we be that facilitator um to help connect to help communicate outward what all the great work that's going on
and not all of that is stuff that's going to get us credit, you know, on our CVs, but like, that's, that's the important work, isn't it? Yeah. Thanks for that question. There's a question in the chat box. So, okay. This one from Himanshu, the, oh, oh, oh. The do first half. Have, I think that's, uh, do you want me to read it out? Uh, just yes, Do you have uh, an advice for young researchers interested in working on social and environmental justice? Yes, I, I um, yeah. So I have written a piece with, uh, Alexa Schindel and Alberto Rodriguez about thinking about relationships and positionality in justice oriented research. And I can share that with you. Let me see if I can find the link. Um, I forget the name of it. <laughs> I think it's called relational responsibility or something like that in justice oriented science education research. Um, but also there is a great organization called the Clear Lab and that's the Civic uh, Laboratory for Activist Science Research, I believe. And um, I can send you that link as well. Let me see if I can find that one here. Yeah, and that one is um, Max LeBaron who runs that in Newfoundland. And they have really amazing um, resources on their website, including little videos um, and notes about, about how to do that work. Let me see if I can just put that in the chat real quick. Here we go. So I would start there because there's so many, yeah, so much that um, that we could talk about there, but they, they have this awesome set of resources. And then the other one uh, we'll share with you as well. Let's see here. Relational responsibility, I think it's called where we write a lot about those like those issues with sometimes, um, for example, research is not always what communities want either. And there are others who have written about the, you know, the idea of refusal, research refusal. So sometimes as an academic, we're just there to support, provide resources, um, do the work of like, like um, La Paperson talks about in a third university as possible about redirecting resources from the university um, to communities. Um, but yeah, there are lots of different ways to, to be in solidarity. It's not just, just one way. So there are different, different models of participatory research, but it really starts with um, centering the, the agency and the desires of that, of that community. Thank you very much for sharing those resources. You're There's welcome. a question from Sunita. I think she'd like to unmute. If you'd like to unmute and talk. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Sarah. I'm Dr. Sunita from Delhi University. Um, Hello. Am I audible to you? Sorry? Am I audible to you, Sarah? I can, yes, yes, I can. Am I audible you. to you? Yes. Hello, yes. Sunita. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hello, I'm from Delhi University. Yeah, my question is related to parenting. What I understand that uh, teachers, objectives, curriculum, books, all are very necessary. But during pandemic, all parents just associated 24 by seven with kids. So is there is any awareness program regarding educational attitude of the parents towards the children and how to deal with its 24 hour? How much the parents have the space and what kind of policies provided by, the, by your government for right kind of parenting during pandemic situation kindly give your uh, such kind of experiences uh, during lockdown thank you so much thank you thank you sunita actually um yeah i think for us when we were in lockdown it was just short little short periods of time here and there um but the teachers were the ones who were in charge of developing the online curriculum. So I know for my own children, they were just at home on their devices and the teachers were directing their learning. And um, I was trying my best to help them. But to be honest, like I gave up. <laughs> I'm not the person to ask. 
I was probably not the best um, lockdown parent because it, it, it gets really, really hard when you're trying to manage the household and your own work responsibilities from home. And um, my partner was an essential worker at the time, so not always here. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question that we probably need to take the time to, to really think about like what kinds of supports and what kinds of not just um, learning resources, but what kinds of like, um, you know, social, educational, um, institutional supports can we provide um, for families to, to make that easier? But I just, I don't know. I think that's really hard. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, really. Uh, yeah, really, Sarah, because we need always quality education. And in developing country like India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, you know, there's the poor parenting. They're not aware about the education. Uh, parameters of assessment. They are just bothered about the conventional kind of assessment. And during pandemic, there is an alternative for the assessment process that they are very open-minded that uh, now the assessment is not only in the form of marking. So uh, as any policy regarding assessment and parenting, because there's a big problem that parents always have one mindset that their kids or their learners having a good marks and all kinds of situations. So during pandemic, do you go for this parameter of assessment? Any any idea about assessment that how they deal with assessment because virtual assessment process is also playing a vital role for the quality education. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably, you know, of course, my response to this is, going to be very much grounded in my own experiences and ideas about the world. And those are very um, limited to my own worldview, right? But I actually think that um, like the pandemic is maybe a time to rethink what we're actually doing in education and how we're assessing learning. And maybe it's a time to think about um, ways in which children and families are involved in like rich um, community oriented activities that just aren't valued by our educational system, like supporting each other or learning how to cook or helping out with the younger children. Um, you know, with sometimes the older children end up helping out with the younger children's schoolwork or, um, you know, playing, playing together out on the streets, for example, like there's a lot of learning that happens in those spaces, but it's not traditionally valued by, um, you know, the way education is, is currently set up and assessed. So I, I wonder a little bit about how things like that can make us think more broadly about what learning is and the ways in which like learning happens all the time and really rich learning happens in, in ways that aren't, aren't traditionally valued by classrooms and schools. And how do we recognize that and support it? And also, I think recognize the ways in which um, families and and are, are often just doing their best to survive in those types of situations day to day. So that that would be my my question about about that. But I don't have the answers. Precisely. Yeah, of course. It's important. I think assessment and practice is important for the for the thinking and rethinking and just regenerate all this process because it's important we have to change our mindset first. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Sumita. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've overshot time. Uh, so uh, I'd like to thank you very much for taking us through your uh, both your personal as well as academic journey and for uh, introducing you, us to the work that you have done with communities uh, of students and teachers with you to empowering them, uh, especially on matters such as food, water and practices within mainstream STEM education, which are racist. Um, so uh, for me, a key takeaway was the notion of social change as not being about praxis as an individual, uh, but praxis as a collective and specific ideas that you mentioned about uh, the notion of undisciplining and imagining transgressive politics through uh, science education. Uh, so some very powerful ideas. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. Uh, so we'll probably close the session now. Um, over to the organizer.